Um, I'd like to welcome you all this evening to the passage and thank you all so much for coming out and supporting your local independent bookstore. I'd also like to welcome you to an incredible evening of literary travel tales. Spearheading the event tonight is Lisa Alpine. Yay! A talented travel writer and extraordinarily talented traveler. She is here with fellow travel writers, Lisa, uh, Lavinia Spaulding. And Lisa will be introducing each of them individually. So I'm going to hand it over to Lisa now and get on with our fabulous evening. Thank you. Have you noticed that travel makes people really attractive? <laughs> and there's a bunch of travel writers in the crowd here, and they're also really attractive. <laughs> And it's not because I'm like short sighted or anything. Yeah. Hey, I want to give a shout out to Don George in the back. Woo! 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 Bye. Bye, Don. Because he has been supportive and launched uh, many, many of us in our quest to write a beautiful story that involves adventures on the road. And without Don's encouragement, most of us would still be working, you know, in those magazines writing the go here, it costs this much, and, you know, destination pieces. But, but Don has always encouraged us to be literarily adventurous, so thank you. Thank you. You see, many of our folks are dedicated to that. Yeah. Traveling, it leaves you speechless, and it turns you into a storyteller. That's somebody named Ibni Batula. Ah. Oh. From, far, from a far land. Welcome to this evening of Tulating Travel Tales. You've met our readers. Uh, Renee Denfeld was going to read tonight. Unfortunately, uh, one of her children's in the hospital up in Portland, so she could not show. Um, and we have the good fortune, uh, Candace was on a flight here and landed sometime around now, 5 o'clock this afternoon <laughs> and came right here to Book Passage. <laughs> So after the reading, we're going to be schmoozing with all of you. Um, I'm hoping to have time for some questions and answers. And uh, we'll also be selling and signing books. So don't depart without coming up and introducing yourselves. I, I personally really enjoy knowing who, who's interested in literary travel tales and connecting with you. It's important, I think. We're a community. Uh, with airplane tickets in our hands, or a backpack on our shoulders, or little salsa shoes in our purse. <laughs> it's, it's nice to know that we're, we're together in this vast global world that we live in, this wonderful planet. So let the adventure begin, and we're going to start off with Marcia DeSantis. Woo! And she has journeyed here from the wilds of Connecticut, I believe. Oh, do I have that right? Yes, you do. <laughs> She is a New York Times best-selling author of 100 Places in France Every Woman Should Go. <laughs> oh yeah, does that title not make you just want to pack your bag? <laughs> what about the men, though? Is that the next book? <laughs> no, men are good. They can go on their own. She's a former television news producer, and she's worked for Barbara Walters, ABC, CBS, and NBC. And her work has appeared in Vogue, uh, Town and Country, Oprah, National Geographic, Traveler, Tin House, and the New York Times. She's also the recipient um, of the Travel Journalist of the Year for Lowell Thomas, and that's a big deal. It's a really big deal. And she and I are also on the um, finalist list for the Indie Fab Awards book of the year in travel. So, woohoo, mano a mano. <laughs> She's a graduate of Princeton. Woo! This is what I found very interesting about you. 
Uh, she just got a master's a few years ago in international relations from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and wrote her thesis on maritime piracy mm. and mm. national security in Africa. Oh. <laughs> Bragging rights. <laughs> and she has two teenagers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said, that's the biggest adventure in the kitchen at home. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa, who um, she hatched this plan several months ago, and I was oh, really delighted to come here from the wilds of Connecticut. And thank you all for being here. I really feel like a place like this, especially with Passage, but every book, every independent bookstore, they're like the hearth of the town, and there's no warmer place uh, to congregate. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to read <clears throat> a story. It's funny, sometimes you look back at things and you think, I didn't write that. <laughs> Did I? Because I was reading it thinking, oh, this is a little, a little too much information. So just there, it's very autobiographical. I mean, miraculously, I didn't put like, my bra size in here. Um, maybe it is in here. I just haven't found it. Um, but but um, it's a little long, and I'm going to kind of, I'm just going to read it and stop. Um, I think that's the best way to do that way. You guys won't get. Um, I won't suck up all the energy for, for the other wonderful readers. So um, this is, uh, so Lavinia was my editor on this story, um, and she said, I hate your title. It's called Connie Britton's Hair. <laughs> and, um, and I said, well, I totally love the title. It has to be the, that has to be the title. And interestingly, I wrote this the first season of Nashville before it was <coughs> Nashville, before everybody knew about it. So with that in mind, please understand that I'm not writing about, like, um, you know, a, a, a piece that was, uh, I mean, a, a show that was around for years and years. This is all kind of new and interesting. And now I love the title. You do. Because <laughs> now I watch Nashville. Because now she watch Nashville. And who doesn't, really? So um, this is called Connie Britton's Hair. Um, and climb every mountain, or maybe don't. <laughs> How much longer, I ask Eugene. We have a very long way, he says. Also, it gets much steeper. In our short acquaintance, I already know our guide isn't one for sweetening the news. In fact, he seems to relish his role as the grim realist, the battlefield reporter with the cold hard facts. It's difficult to say which half of his response fills me with greater dread. Long way, like another hour, I ask, panic leaking into my voice, steeper than this. With an upraised palm, like the hostess at a car show, I indicate the vertical swath of mud looming above me. It's not yet 9 a.m., but an hour since we started at Mount Busaki, a dormant volcano in the Virunga Range which straddles northwest Rwanda, southern Uganda, and the eastern reaches of the DRC. My legs are trembling, periodically forcing me to lurch off the wet, shiny stones into clusters of stinging nettles and pools of black magma sludge. There are seven other climbers, and the Greek one won't shut up. Between his white noise and the realization that my body is already failing me, I know I need to make quick work of this mountain. The woman who booked my excursion assured me I'd be back in the hotel in time for lunch. The idea that I'd also be alive was implicit. <laughs> yet, <laughs> now I already feel the heat of a fresh bruise spreading across the upper quadrant of my right thigh after one humiliating tumble. I have no idea for whom or what I'm traipsing upstream of a landslide, and I kind of want to get back to Nashville and Connie Britton's hair. <laughs> when I arrived at the park early this morning, after registering and filling a mug with coffee, Pierre, my driver and companion for the week, directed me to the briefing with Eugene. The man was all business, laconic, and unsmiling. From the outset, I tried to soften his bluntness, bluntness with my usual attempt at charm. It was a cry for reassurance, the obvious ploy of the terminally insecure. Mm -hmm. I hear this is a snap, I said, my voice larded with cheer. A couple hours up and back. Oh no, not during the rainy season, which we were smack in the middle of, he said. It's a strenuous climb. You must be very fit. <laughs> I, scoped, I scoped out the other climbers. Demetrius the Greek, already chattering pointlessly, was no David Beckham. Nor were the Russians exactly Olympic decathletes. The rest, I surmised, were roughly on a par with me. 
Only Monica from Holland looked to be in fighting shape. But she was about 20 and, well, Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> I took a spin class once in a while. I managed. The air was laced with the smell of eucalyptus at the clearing beyond the entrance of Volcanoes National Park, the staging area for the day's excursions. The other tourists, most of whom were preparing or at least hoping to see the gorillas, milled about under a large gazebo, sipping coffee and tea to ward off the chilly morning. I snickered at the safari folk tricked out in gadgetry and pricey adventure wear. <laughs> Gators, air permeable layers, and high performance hiking boots. I was awfully confident in my trail running shoes and my teenage daughter's surf hoodie. <laughs> Sunlight shot across the mountains and fields, rapidly erasing the shadows from the landscape. It was a gorgeous morning for a trek, much like the one I'd enjoyed a year before when I'd set off with seven other people and two guides in search of gorillas. We'd been unusually lucky that morning. Our group had barely broken a sweat when we got word that our family of primates, which included a set of newborn twins, was about to swing into view. On that trip, my first to Rwanda, I'd been captivated by the sight of the gorillas, but also by the vision of five volcanoes that formed a sensuous but formidable ridge cradling the forest. It didn't occur to me that I'd be back a year later to climb one. I'm not much of a nature girl, but because I come from hardy immigrant stock, ship captains and quarrymen on one side, farmers on the other, I'm a bit ashamed of my predilection for pure linen sheets mm -hmm. and finely tooled Italian pups. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Case in point. It's always struck me as a weakness, a trait I should at least resist, if not somehow overcome. When I was young, although I preferred to spend summers perfecting my country club backhand, I nevertheless marched off to camp in Vermont every year with my three older sisters, outfitted in flame retardant shorts and rubber boots, that <laughs> even then offended my fashion standards. <laughs> I was certain, as was my mother probably, that if I could rough it even briefly, I would be a better and more selfless person. There were no tennis courts or bubble baths or downy pillows in the flume slide trail of Mount Washington, but the stew we slung up in our mess kits was tasty and the hardship temporary. I didn't exactly love the cold nights I spent shivering in my sleeping bag on a floor covered with grit and spiders and a lot of other campers, but I did appreciate the camaraderie and shared purpose, at least in retrospect. Many years later, when I could make the choice, I almost settled down with an Argentinian clothes horse, but instead married the reincarnation of Ernest Shackleton, an outdoorsman who has bestowed his love and adventure and fresh air upon our children. And I appreciate this, because it takes the heat off me. <laughs> While my family sets out on summer mornings before dawn on 20-mile hikes in the Adirondacks, I sleep in. <laughs> Long after the sun comes up, I enjoy the view of the mountains <laughs> from my perch across the lake over slices of toast with marmalade. <laughs> I've taken on the role of princess in our family narrative, and my children and husband play along, coddling me, but also needling me lovingly about my preference for the language lion over physical exertion of any kind. They fall short of calling me lazy, but their known euphemisms speak their own truth, or so I imagine. After hip replacement at 45, I finally had the excuse I needed to basically never go outside again. <laughs> <laughs> but now, a few years later and a few years older, I've begun to find this conceit tarnishing with age, and, um, and my adventure phobia uh, turning into one of many, sorry about that, oncoming regrets. The bifocals. <laughs> <laughs> when my family pushes off with their water bottles and trail mix, I still wave goodbye cheerfully, but with a nagging sense that by hanging back on solid ground, I'm missing how many seminal moments, the gorgeously lit future memories that will, if I can only bring myself to participate, flood my mind when I'm nearly done on earth, a day from dying. I've never seen my son run up ahead on antelope legs, nor have I extended my hand to my daughter over a steep patch of trail and seeing determination flood her being. And then there's something else. Not since my summers trudging up the White Mountains had I experienced the singular do-or-die obstinacy it takes to make it up and down a tricky slope, heart and legs begging for mercy. Lately, I've begun to envy the accomplishment my family feels after a day's climb and how honestly they've earned their fatigue. 
Several months ago, the reporting trip to Rwanda on the calendar, I decided it was the perfect opportunity to tackle a mountain. And after some online research, I determined that Bisoki, the easy one, was the one for me. Which is why, with the clock running out on opportunities to conquer things, I'm inching up the side of the volcano this morning. Only now, an hour into the climb, I'm beginning to understand that Bisaki's reputation might be relative, like calling Pulp Fiction Quentin Tarantino's least violent movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also realizing that the people who climb volcanoes for fun apparently block for other people who climb volcanoes for fun, and not for people like me. I frequently travel solo. Often this is because I'm on assignment, but the other truth is I'm someone who craves the brief solitary journey. I live for these respites. When I eat meals alone, answer to no one, keep my own counsel. It's only after dinner, during the hours of extreme quiet in my room, while the single glass of wine drains from my system and I wait for sleep, that I get twinges of loneliness. I wonder where my kids are, and began to question, and begin to question what problem I'm, try, I'm trying to solve in my need to escape. I found that the best distraction from the torture of my misgivings and the attendant insomnia is entertainment. But 25 watt bulbs, the bedside standard in a certain kind of hotel, offer my eyes little sustenance for reading. Nights on international assignments, therefore, have turned into an excuse to watch whatever TV series I've missed <laughs> that everyone insists I should see. And this time, here in remote Rwanda, it's Nashville. <laughs> and I wind up about generational rivalry in country music with gorgeous tunes often sung by Connie Britton. Who is this woman? In Nashville, she plays Raina James, a woman roughly my age, give or take a couple of years, okay, 10, <laughs> a beloved country singer. Facing challenges from an ambitious up-and-comer. I'm hooked after three episodes, and all because of her. It isn't just the pitch, the actress strikes perfectly, portraying both celebrity and suburban housefrau. It's her character's take on middle age. She never lapses into self-pity. She has too much going on to dwell on the inevitable downsides of aging. Instead, she keeps evolving by working harder than anybody else. And in so doing, she spares us the usual 40 and fabulous bromides and cougar manifestos <laughs> endemic in pop culture. It helps that, with wavy strawberry blonde hair, coiffed with curl liners and volumizer and a wardrobe that changes in the course of 50 minutes from jeans to a sheath dress to spangles and back again, along with her nail polish, navy blue, aubergine, flannel gray, <laughs> she is endlessly fascinating to watch. She's groomed and rich and desired by men of every age. And she never wears the same, same pair of Louboutins twice. Uh -huh. And I confess, as I looked down at my legs trudging up Mount Bisaki in these god-awful hiking pants, <laughs> I hate her <laughs> for all of it. But mostly, I admire and even envy her. Time is precious, her actions insist. And she braves one creative leap after another. Unlike me, the woman is afraid of nothing. What I've never told my family, what they don't know, is that I'm averse to na nature writ large because, in fact, it terrifies me. I fear insects and unseen branches that could draw blood from my neck. As for mountains, I fear I won't make it up, and even worse, that I won't make it back down. What doesn't scare me, the four soldiers from the Rwandan Air Forces with AK-47 strapped to their torsos who are accompanying us on our climb. That security, as far as I'm concerned. We are spitting distance from the DRC, where brutal war is in full swing, and refugees and soldiers are rumored, rumored to be seeking cover in the dense forest. I don't care if some hopped up Congolese rebel interrupts our peace. I'm not even afraid of the wild buffalo, known to pose an even greater threat to tourists. I'm only afraid of confronting my own helplessness. I'm going to stop there, oh. and uh, it's a little long, so thank you so much. <laughs>
Travel, travel. <laughs> <laughs> National Geographic's intelligent travel <laughs> instead of the stupid travel. I think stupid travel would be better, don't you, Don? <laughs> National Geographic's stupid travel <laughs> site. I think that would be so interesting. <laughs> um, it would be. Tim, do, who knows who Tim Cahill is? Oh, okay. He started Outside Magazine and has since done bunches of travel anthologies. And his secret that he revealed one time at the Book Passage Travel Writers Conference, his secret to success, something's got to go wrong. <laughs> or, if that doesn't happen, you have to travel with somebody who's accident prone. <laughs> <laughs> or somebody you hate. I thought that was very good advice. It was very good stories. Anyway, back to Candace. Um, and you've done the cover to Don's upcoming book, is that correct? Yeah. Don has a book coming out in a couple of months. Yep. And the title is? The Way of Wanderlust. Yeah. Yeah, we're all in love with Don. You know, so have to put up with it. Anyway, Candace did the um, illustrations for it on the cover. Um, in addition, she has also done the cover to Best Women's Travel Writing, which Lavinia is the editor of. That book in the middle there. Um, and her travel blog, The Great Affair, has been featured in the New York Times, and she earned an MA in travel writing from Kingston University Woo! in London. So I, uh, she sent that to me in a text from uh, the airport, I think. It was very well done. Yeah. And guess who's, guess who's up? <laughs> Thank you all so much. I have to confess, I didn't do the cover for Lavinia's anthology, but I do have a story in it. Um, and the rest of Marsha's story is in there, so that's a little motivation to check that book out. Um, well, it's so great to be here with you. I couldn't imagine a better way to arrive in San Francisco than with a message. Of, Would you like to read tonight? So I'm very excited. Um, I'm going to be reading from another anthology called An Innocent Abroad, um, also edited by Don George. Um, Lonely Planet publishes an anthology every year. Um, dedicated to literary travel stories, and I was really honored to have um, this story included in it. And it's called Two Angels in Anatolia. Mm. And it starts with a quote from Brian Weiss that says, For truly, we are all angels temporarily hiding as humans. When I decided to walk the Evlia Chalevi Way, a 220 mile trail across northwest Turkey, named after the 17th century Ottoman traveler whose pilgrimage to Mecca it follows, I didn't exactly stop and consider whether doing so as a woman on my own would be safe. I did question if my decision not to purchase a pricey GPS in Istanbul beforehand was foolhardy. The authors of the only guidebook to the route had deemed the item essential after all. <laughs> but for the most part, there was little that gave me pause before embarking on the journey. Not the fact that my backpack tipped the scales at nearly half my own body weight, nor the fact that sleeping alone in a tent along a mountainous path might prove more frightening than fun. Nor the fact that I spoke no Turkish and would be passing through remote villages where my chances of coming across anyone who spoke English were incredibly slim. In fact, my only real concern on the day I left Istanbul had been finding an appropriate pair of waterproof trousers to wear on the trail. For the first three weeks, however, my time trekking through Anatolia was a brilliant success. I befriended farmers and shepherds, was invited to sleep in local families' homes, listened to the call to prayer ring out across the olive groves and tomato fields, reveled in ruins over 2,000 years old, picked up dozens of new words in Turkish, and every day grew a tiny bit closer to the route's final destination of Simav. And yes, the waterproof pants had held up remarkably well against all manner of rain, wind, mud, stream crossings, bushwhacking, forest navigating, and encounters with curious goats. One Sunday morning, my 20th day on the Evliya Chalevi Way, and just two days from Simav, I arrived in the village of Gerlik. There wasn't much to distinguish it from the scores of villages I had already passed through. A small sign at the entrance to the town read Hoshgal Deniz, one of the first phrases I'd learned, Turkish for welcome. All the narrow, dusty streets led to a silver-domed mosque with two minarets, the sapphire tiles on their pinnacles gleaming in the bright sunlight. And when I came to the village Kava, or tea house, I was quickly ushered inside by several gray-haired men for a steaming cup of chai. Like the countless other villagers I'd met during the trek, they laughed away any attempt to leave a lira or two in the saucer of my tulip-shaped teacup. 
By the time I left Gerlich, my belly was warm from tea and my heart from yet another gesture of kindness from strangers. I had heard stories about Turkish hospitality before arriving in the country, but it had been altogether different and profoundly humbling to experience for, my, for myself time after time. So caught up was I in my reverie, reflecting over the generosity I had been shown on my journey thus far, that it took me longer than it should have to notice two young men following me out of the village. They seemed to be in their early 20s, and I recognized one of them from the Kaaba. He had offered to accompany me over a mountain, claiming it was a shorter way than the stabilized road I planned to take, but I declined. Apparently, he hadn't accepted my answer. No matter how fast I walked, they held my pace. This went on for 15 minutes, until I turned around and thought I might as well confront them head on. I planted both feet in the ground, superwoman style, and held my walking stick as though it were more than just a long branch I found on day eight and carried with me ever since. What do you want, I asked, hoping I looked far more formidable than I felt. Why are you following me? Sly grins broke out across their faces. We go to our fields. I couldn't argue with this, but still I was shaken. I passed a small farmhouse and saw an older couple sitting outside. We waved hello to each other, and though I contemplated stopping and waiting for the guys to pass, I kept going. Minutes later, a car pulled up and lowered its window. It was the same couple, offering me a ride to the next village of Uchvash, some two hours away on foot. This wasn't the first time I had been taken as an unsuccessful hitchhiker. People were constantly slowing down beside me, and I was forever having to tell them that I was Gizme Gidmik, or taking a walk. A very long walk, you might say. I didn't know if this couple was merely being kind, or if they had seen the guys in my trail and taken it upon themselves to convey me safely to Uchvash. As we talked, I watched a pair come into view and turn down a side road between fields. I watched them until they crouched to the ground and disappeared out of sight. I thanked the couple, explained that if at all possible, I wanted to walk every mile to Simov and continued on the path. A little voice inside me asked if I was being stubborn or just stupid. After a few minutes, I glanced behind me and saw the men cutting across the field, once again heading in my direction. That's when my annoyance turned to fear. It isn't something I experience often in my day-to-day -day existence as a writer and artist, sitting at my desk or sketching on location. But here, there was no mistaking it. The pulse quickening, blood thickening, instinctual feeling of fear, pumping a steady surge of adrenaline to every cell in my body. I could feel it with the tips of my fingers, coursing through my veins, making every hair stand on its unwashed end. The last time I felt fear so physically was at the edge of the Nevis high wire platform in New Zealand, as I was about to throw myself off the country's highest bungee jump. But there had been a safety cord around my ankles then, and despite official warnings and waivers, I had every reason to believe I would be just fine. There was no such assurance on the road out of Gerlich. Again, I had thrown myself off the edge of a safe life into the unknown, and for three weeks, by the grace of God or chance or some uncanny combination of the two, I had stayed out of harm's way. The villagers I met never failed to warn me of the dangers I faced, of dogs and bears, of wolves, wild, wolves and wild pigs, and those they called bad people. The first question they always asked was, Cork, was I afraid? Every time, I blithely assured them I was not, that I had met nothing but good people. But deep inside me, that same voice spoke. Was I trusting or just naive? I couldn't help but think that maybe my luck had at last run out. Had the limits of my innocent faith in the world and its ability to take care of me been stretched too far? I was alone on a deserted road in rural Turkey. I hadn't checked in with my family for days, and I didn't even know if the road I'd taken was the one I needed to be on. Behind me were two guys whose intentions for following me were anything but clear. Did they have their eyes set on the expensive camera swinging from my neck? Perhaps the wallet one guy had seen me take out of my backpack in the Kaaba. Or was their objective much darker? As a woman who usually travels alone, I am all too used to conjuring up a hundred worst case scenarios in my mind. I didn't want to let the guys know I was worried, so I forced myself to keep my gaze fixed straight ahead. I walked as fast as I could until it would be considered running. I came to a stretch in the road where it partially went back on itself, and when I crossed a short bridge that was sheltered by oak trees, I cast a quick glance behind me through the branches. Not only were the guys still there, now they were the ones running. And so I did what I'd done a few other times on the path when things were getting desperate. I stopped walking, looked up at the big blue dome of the sky stretching out above me, and said three words, please help me. 
What I had hoped would materialize was another car, preferably one aiming for Uchbash. But what I couldn't have known to pray for were two middle-aged men suddenly emerging from the forest, walking sticks clicking in time with their stride, ambling towards my path as though this were, more, as though this were a perfectly normal place to be on a Sunday morning stroll. Merhaba, I called out to them. Hello. I waited for them to reach the road and was relieved when they said I was heading in the right direction. We said goodbye and went our separate ways. Me to Uchbash, they to Gerlich. I felt some of the stress begin to fall away, knowing there was now a buffer between the two guys and me. I was even wondering what the guys might say if they encountered the men, when I heard a loud voice booming from above. I looked towards the top of the bluff and saw it was the same two men. I didn't understand what they were saying, but again, I stood there while they made their way down the road. And when they got to where I was, they carried on walking with me as though we hadn't just parted five minutes earlier. I didn't get it. Had they, like the couple from before, come across the guys and realized I might need help? Or had they simply discussed the situation between themselves, this blonde-haired, fair-skinned female foreigner walking on her own, and decided she could use some company to the next town? They walked with me for an hour, and as we walked, I got to know them. Their names were Ishmael and Murat, and from what I could tell, they had been friends since they were kids. Ishmael was 62, with salt and pepper hair and a matching mustache. Murat was five years younger and several inches shorter. They were each dressed in a standard male villager's outfit, button-down collared shirt, pressed pants, or jeans in Ishmael's case, and a blazer with patches on the elbows. Although they had both grown up at Gerlich, Ishmael said he now lived in the seaside city of Izmir and was back for two weeks seeing friends and family. Walking with Ishmael and Murat, I never felt safer on the trail. In an instant, the pendulum of my fear had swung to the other side. I could relax and finally notice how beautiful the countryside around us was. The open rolling hills, which before had seemed almost too open, too quiet, were once again inspiring, their slopes a pastoral patchwork of autumn's glory. The two men laughed a lot, and I imagined it to be the laugh of old friends ribbing each other. They introduced me to a few shepherds we passed, and every so often, Murat would stop and dig around in the soil along the road with his walking stick. I didn't know what he was looking for, until at one point, he kicked away dirt from what appeared to be a round white stone, reached down, and wrenched from the ground the largest mushroom I had ever seen. <laughs> he carried it with him proudly, his walking stick in one hand and the mushroom held high in the other. It took Ishmael 45 minutes to remember he had a plastic grocery bag in the front pocket of his blazer, which he then ceremoniously fluffed open and gave to Murat to transport his prize in. Soon after Uchbash came into sight on the horizon, we arrived at a junction. I would go right, the men would go left and return to Gerlach. I wanted to hug them, but settled for modest handshakes. With each man, I placed both my hands on his and tried to communicate, through osmosis, if not by words, just how much I appreciated their company, just how much of a gift and a godsend it had been. I'm not sure they understood, for when they walked away, I only saw them shake their heads and mutter, Mashallah, Mashallah, God has willed it, God has willed it. I will always wonder why Ishmael and Murat turned around that morning, why they decided to go two hours out of their way to walk with me. I will always wonder what would have happened if they hadn't. One of the things I've learned in my wanderings is that travel demands a certain amount of trust from us. This trust may sometimes seem naive, but if we were to let our fear of fear have its way, we would never set off on a trip. Indeed, we might never leave our homes. For as soon as we step out the door, off the edge, and open ourselves to the world, we also open ourselves to the possibility that things may not always be safe. But I have found the rewards the world offers us are almost always worth the, worth the risk, as they were on that Sunday morning in Anatolia, when two angels walked with me on the Evelia to Levy Way. language when you say all those words mm -hmm. places and meanings mm. so our next reader is Lavinia Spaulding and she's the series editor of the best women's travel writing and also the author of two books writing away a creative guide to awakening the journal writing traveler and with a measure of grace, the stories and recipes of a small town restaurant. Where, where is that restaurant? It's in Boulder, Utah. It's a town of 180 people. Mm. Most remote town in the lower 48 states. Mm. 
Worth the journey? <laughs> Someone I met there in the Sierras says, yes. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Excellent. <laughs> Boulder, Utah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Good. She lives in San Francisco now, and uh, she's a resident at the Writer's Grotto, who oh, they also put on excellent reading series, by the way, writersgrotto.org or com. And uh, she's a faculty member here at the Book Passage Travel Writing Conference that Don hosts. <laughs> And um, she's also the co-founder of the award-winning monthly travel reading series Weekday Wanderlust at the Rex Hotel in San Francisco. Another uh, link that you should connect with if you enjoy literary travel stories every month. The next one is, you're going to love this, um, <laughs> I'm not making this up, it's on the 17th of this month at the Rex in San Francisco. You're gonna be there, I bet. Lori's gonna be, and I always feel like Nancy from Romper Room and I see Erin, Erin's gonna be there. And, well, we know Dawn's gonna be there because it's Donder, Donderlust. It's the, we, the, I think it's the third annual celebration of Dawn's birthday. Um, this is just totally freaky that you showed up here. I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> we definitely are all related. We have like these bloodlines going back through the words. Anyway, um, all of Lavinia doesn't consider herself an adventure traveler, she, but uh, she has participated in. I know, Erin, I did the same thing. I would say, what? Um, She's participated in adrenaline sports all over the world from hang gliding, whitewater rafting, and trapezing to skydiving, rappelling, and canyoneering. She once participated in a rally race in South Korea with a live eel used as a baton. And I think we need a reenactment. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I need to see that. I was hard. Did it bite you? It was trying to bite me, and I face planted. What on earth convinced you to do, participate in that? <laughs> Adventure, <laughs> I guess. Your unadventurous nature, of course. <gasps> anyway, her biggest and most recent adventure, uh, as of two months ago, is motherhood. <laughs> she gave birth to a little boy. Hey. Yeah. And I think all of us will agree who've given birth that motherhood is a huge adventure that just never stops. <laughs> <laughs> decade after decade. <laughs> yeah. So come on up, Lavinia. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thanks, everyone. I've been actually thinking a lot about the word adventure lately and writing about it and how the definition shifts as you age. And um, so it's, it's fun to be here. I, I have participated in a lot of traditional sort of adventures around the world. Um, you know, I, I went elephant riding in Chiang Mai, and I went scuba diving in the Great Barrier Reef, and I climbed a live volcano in Bali. And, and this year, actually, I took my little fetus to, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's now a baby. I, uh, I took him uh, snorkeling in Costa Rica, I took him to Machu Picchu, we went llama camping in Utah. Um, but, uh, but as a writer, as a travel writer, my favorite sort of adventure is taking um, what in the moment feels like a total nightmare, a total disaster, and turning that with my pen into an adventure. Uh, that's my favorite thing to do. And I was really um, psyched when, uh, when my story was also chosen for this program is underwritten by Don George. Uh, <laughs> productions, sorry, by Don George's uh, An Innocent Abroad. Um, uh, so it's a story that kind of goes back and forth from uh, Thailand to Korea, and I'm going to read an, a condensed version, and it's not really an adventure story, but it's definitely a disaster nightmare story um, that I tried to turn into an adventure. It's called Stolen. The voice was booming, packed with obscenities, and deep, almost supernaturally deep. It was unlike any sound my lungs had ever produced, but there was no time for contemplation. It was 2 a.m. in Busan, South Korea, and an intruder was in my living room. 
The instant I unlocked my front door and spotted him crouched behind the sofa, the primal deep voice response activated. Then, after one suspended moment, he launched himself at me. I sprang back flat against the wall, and he was in front of me, Korean, lanky, wearing a black nylon jacket and baggy pants. I braced for the attack, but he ricocheted against my body, shot into the hall, and tumbled two long flights of steps to the street. I slammed and deadbolted the door, my hands shaking. Then I heard his feet slapping the pavement outside. I flipped open my cell phone and stared at it. My hangul wasn't fluent enough to explain anything to the police tonight, and it was too late to call my Korean friends. My French boyfriend lived across the world in New Mexico, and we were in a fight anyway, a no. for a breakup. <laughs> Finally, I dialed Marnie. I had put her in a cab ten minutes before, and she lived clear across Busan, near our university. She wouldn't be home yet. I heard her ask the driver to turn around. I'll stay the night with you, she offered. Thanks, I said, finally taking a normal breath. But remember I told you my pipes burst. There's no heat in my apartment. It's freezing. It was only the second week of January, and already I hated this year. <laughs> Two weeks earlier, on the island of Koh Samui in Thailand, I was sharing a Song Tao, a covered pickup truck with open sides and two long benches in back with six strangers. It was another sweltering day, and my legs clung to each other like saran wrap. After two weeks of lounging on Thai islands, I was en route to catch a ferry to lounge on Malaysian islands. I also had loose intentions of visiting the Patronus Twin Towers, staying in historic Malacca, and exploring the Chung Fat Se mansion in Georgetown. But my only solid plan was to hit the American embassy in Kuala Lumpur and add pages to my passport. After many years of travel, my little blue book, my most cherished possession, was fat with colorful stamps and visas and memories, and it could take no more. I need supplemental pages before crossing bo any borders that required a full page visa, and though I had no specific plans, the likelihood of that happening soon was high. My job in Korea teaching ESL at a university was the stuff of expat dreams. A generous salary for working 12 hours a week, a serene mountain campus, Students so respectful, they bowed from the hip when they saw me at the cafeteria. <laughs> and five months of paid vacation, metered out as a week here, 12 days there, a month, six weeks. I didn't believe in staying home during a paid vacation, so I existed perpetually in four stages. Planning, leaving, gone, returning. <laughs> but Malaysia would be my first solo trip. When the Song Tower arrived at the dock and pitched to a stop, I stood up, crouched over, and reached for my purse. I usually wore a money belt, but for this trip, I opted for a cute travel purse slung across my sunburned shoulder. A cute travel purse containing all my money, credit cards, and plane tickets, as well as my passport. A cute travel purse I must have left in the guest, guest house cafe across the island, where I just said a teary goodbye to my best friend and her boyfriend. The Songtow driver was waiting for me to pay. My bag's gone, I announced to the truck looking beseechingly between impassive backpackers and locals. Can someone lend me money for the fare? A song tao, one of the cheapest transportation options in Thailand, is not where one goes to find magnanimous benefactors. <laughs> they looked at me sideways. Please, I begged. Finally, a wiry American in a sweat-stained t-shirt with Thai script fished 20 baht, 40 cents from his pocket. Thank you so much, I gushed. He rolled his eyes and looked away. Back at the guest house, I found Aaron and Drew sipping Singha beers at the table where we'd eaten breakfast an hour before. They were due to leave at any minute for Koh Tao to become dive certified before moving to Canada. Aaron paid my tuk-tuk driver while Drew and I searched the cafe in vain. Could I have left it, I wondered, in the Song Tao? Oh. Then their driver arrived. We have to go, Aaron said, I'm sorry. She shoved all her bot in my hand, hugged me, and was gone. That whole week, I stayed on Koh Samui. Twice I visited the police chief. Twice he instructed me to stay put. You leave will be difficult, he said, scribbling a few more indecipherable notes on my police report before handing it back across his desk with a reassuring nod. You wait a few more day. In a fluorescent internet cafe, I researched Bangkok addresses, the American embassy, the Korean embassy, the post office where I'd pick up funds my mother would wire. I instant messaged my French boyfriend in New Mexico, who was helpful with research, but increasingly less helpful in the emotion department. A single dad, he'd chosen this week to arrive at the realization that he'd been ne neglecting his 10-year-old daughter during our intense long-distance love affair. She required more attention. I got less. 
I watched other backpackers arrive and leave, arrive and leave. I walked the island, scribbled in my journal, lay in my hammock, and spent as little of Aaron's bot as possible. But mostly I sat by the sea, raking sand through my fingers and wondering how, after all my travels, I had become such an amateur. Wondering how, after all my eagerness to travel alone, I had so quickly come to despise it. In Busan, I hung up with Marnie and perched on the edge of my mattress, waiting for her footsteps on the stairs. I knew I should search my apartment to see if anything was missing. If I discovered the intruder had stolen something, I'd feel better. I'd know he was just a thief, nothing worse. But I couldn't move. In five years, I had never felt fear in Pusan, not even walking home alone in the middle of the night. I hardly ever glanced over my shoulder. Guns were illegal in Korea, and violence was scant. I'd never felt anything but safe, until now. After one week on Koh Samui, against the police chief's advice, I left. I'm sorry you give up, he said, looking genuinely disappointed in me. <laughs> I booked a flight to Bangkok, which they let, miraculously let me board, accepting my police report as an identification, and arrived depressed to begin the process of reclaiming my identity. Khao San Road, the main tourist drag, is a despicable place for someone who doesn't want to be in Bangkok. Someone who has logged more than enough time in Bangkok. Someone who was this close to her first big solo adventure. Khao San Road is a chaotic vortex of tacky consumerism, dirty hostels, sleazy bars, and soulless cafes. Forget ugly Americans, Khao San Rose Road is where tourists from all great nations converge to get ugly, to haggle over <laughs> pennies and fall down blitzed in broad daylight. I hated Khao San Road and it was the last place I wanted to be. Khao San Road, I told my tuk-tuk driver. <laughs> I would splurge, I decided, on a room at the D&D. Ten bucks a night, it cost three times what most other options did, but it was also three times as nice. The rooms had TVs, phones, and private bathrooms. An actual receptionist worked the front desk, actual housekeepers changed beds, and actual walls separated rooms. <laughs> there was even a rooftop pool, albeit closed for renovation, but I didn't care. Perhaps for the first time in my life about a rooftop pool, all I cared about was securing the necessary documents to get me back out on the road soon. Day after day, I flagged tuk-tuks to deliver me to the American Embassy, the Korean Embassy, the Asiana Airlines office. Bamboo-thin women in cherry-red lipstick and snug charcoal suits stood behind desks, clucking their sympathy. I needed a new passport, a new Korean work visa, a new Thai visa, and plane tickets to transport me back to Korea. Once I secured a passport, the rest would be easy, but the American Embassy wasn't budging. They could not, they patiently explained, issue me a new passport without ID. I visited daily and begged, unfolding and refolding my police report, which was starting to look ratty. But then, so was I. Following each unsuccessful embassy visit, I drifted through neighborhoods I never knew existed, stopping in tiny cafes with no English on the menu, and eating simple food that tasted more Thai than anything I'd been served on Khao San Road. Each afternoon, I retreated to the comfort of my air-conditioned hotel room. On day four, I lay in my bed for hours watching a Backstreet Boys marathon on VH1. <laughs> Videos, concerts, exclusive interviews, Super fans who screamed and blubbered. I reached for the phone and called my French boyfriend. No answer. I returned to the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> they were available and sensitive and so comforting in their Americanness. <laughs> Show me the meaning of being lonely. I sang in the shower when I mustered the will to shower. <laughs> the next morning, tired of moping, I toured Wat Arun at sunrise. I'd read enthusiastic reviews of the Temple of the Dawn, but had skipped it on past visits to Bangkok, because the guidebooks advised actually arriving at dawn for optimal views and minimal crowds. I was not an arrive at dawn person. But the advice was sound. The site was all but empty, and the colors were dazzling. I strolled by the river, still half asleep, photographing the white stupa poking the sky, zooming in on enormous statues of kings and Buddhas and a clown-like protector demon with fangs, green skin and bulging eyes. I climbed the steep steps, ornately tiled with colored glass, porcelain, and seashells to the top of the central tower where I photographed the skyline. I'd never seen the Bangkok skyline, and as I beheld the city with no one to comment to, no one with whom to share the experience, it occurred to me that even as I resented being in Bangkok, I was still doing it, traveling alone for the first time. I just expected myself to be better company. 
I emailed my mom in Arizona. Don't you have anything with my photo and name? They won't give me a passport without it, and without a passport, I can't get anything else. She had excavated her filing cabinets, but turned up nothing of use. I'd been away from home 13 years, and all proof of my identity was now locked in my apartment in Korea, which no one had keys to except my landlord, whose phone number was also locked in my apartment in Korea. <laughs> Finally, Mom emailed. She'd located my birth certificate and was faxing it to the embassy. I hurried over. The young woman smiled encouragingly. Come back tomorrow, she said. I think this can work. I returned the next day. Sorry, a different person said. Did I happen to have some photo ID? The next day, Mom got creative, faxing a copy of her own driver's license alongside a photo of the two of us. I returned to the embassy. The young woman studied the facts, disappeared into the back room for five minutes, then returned and again smiled encouragingly. Come back tomorrow, she said, which of course I did. Good news, the man at the win window announced the next afternoon. This would suffi suffice, and they would issue me a new passport on Wednesday. At the internet cafe on Casson Road, I wrote my mother. It worked. Then I sent a mass email informing my entire address book of my trials in Thailand. Within seconds, a reply came. We're in Bangkok, too, Svetlana's email said, on Kaosan Road. I'd met Svetlana from Serbia and her American husband, Mike, in Bangkok four years prior, and we'd kept in touch casually by email. I didn't know them well, but I liked them, and they were here, and I was no longer alone. That night, I met Svetlana and Mike for dinner, over pot siu and green curry with prawns and one giant chain beer after the next. We reminisced and philosophized. Mike described a diving trip in Belize, and Svetlana regaled me with her account of recently getting her American citizenship. When we said goodnight, it was late and we were drunk. At three in the morning, my phone rang. You have a visitor, the receptionist said. You have the wrong number, I said, hanging up. The phone rang again. Your friend is here, the receptionist said. I don't have a friend, I answered. <laughs> Hold, please. Svetlana had left Mike. We had a terrible fight, she said, standing in my door, sniffling. <laughs> he raised his hand to me. He hit you? No, but he hit the wall in our room. Could she sleep on my floor, she asked. Svetlana was supermodel beautiful, leggy and flawless, and everything from skin to hair to cheekbones to teeth to eyebrows. But right now, she looked a frantic mess. Black mascara, skid marks beneath swollen eyes, hair disheveled. I gave her a blanket, a t-shirt, the use of my toothbrush. She had grabbed only one item leaving her hotel, she told me, sitting on the edge of my bed. Her passport. Well, that's all you really need, isn't it? I asked. After all, it was the one thing I wanted most in the world. No, she said, her eyes filling with tears. I can't believe I didn't take my tweezers. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> when Marnie arrived, back in Korea, when Marnie arrived, I was still shaking. I can't figure out how he got in. My door was locked. Maybe through the window? Locked. All I can think is that one of the workers who came last month to fix the sink made a key. Get the locks changed, just in case. As I recounted the events for her, I tried replicating my freakishly deep voice, but couldn't come close. It was like the exorcist, I said. It was not my voice. It was the voice of a pissed off 250 pound wrestler. Do you guys know what voice I'm talking about? Yep. I, I, like, when, Sorry to pause, but it was like this. <laughs> I was like, get out of my apartment. I don't know if that came across. It was really weird. It was the sound of a pissed off 200 voice, 250 pound wrestler. And you know, I said to Marnie, when, you think, when he heard it, I think he was more scared of me than I was of him. <laughs> Well, she said, isn't it nice to know you have that big voice inside to protect you? <laughs> Though I'd seen Marnie every week at school, I barely knew her. Living with Erin the past two years, I hadn't needed other friends, not to mention that for months I'd been consumed with my long-distance relationship. But then I'd returned from Thailand to an empty, heatless apartment in a record cold winter during Chuseok, the Korean New Year, no less, when the entire country shuts down and no one fixes pipes. Sitting alone and miserable in my unlivable apartment, I'd realized I had to reach out and make friends. Marnie seemed nice, so I'd invited her to go dancing. Now I looked pitifully at my newest friend. Will you sleep in my bed with me? In Bangkok, Svetlana and I ran errands. In bustling covered markets, we bought pajamas, a toothbrush, underwear, and tweezers. In internet cafes, we updated friends and family. 
I bemoaned my misfortune while Svetlana informed everyone that she'd left her husband. Mike emailed, apologized, begged. She ignored him. We picked up money her family wired at the same post office where I had retrieved, retrieved mine. We ate, drank coffee, talked about our men. She taught me to say I love you in Serbian. I taught her hello in Korean. On Wednesday, Svetlana said she'd accompany me to the embassy to pick up my passport. What else do I have to do, she asked. After 20 minutes in the lobby, they called my name. I'm sorry, the woman in the window said. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not enough. We cannot issue a passport without identification. I closed my eyes, inhaled, and exhaled. What am I supposed to do, I demanded, my voice squeaky, my eyes stinging with tears. I'm out of options. I can't stay in Bangkok. I have a job to return to. What else can I do? Well, she said, pausing, there is one other way. I have never seen anyone look so proud, so pers purposeful and dignified and lovely as Svetlana when she handed the clerk her own brand new passport, then raised her right hand as a United States citizen, and with her left hand in a Bible, swore in the slightest accent that I was one too. I'm going to stop there. Um, thank you very much. So then I downsized the length of my trips to a month to two months in that zone. And um, my travel mantra was provided by the great travel writer Durga Murphy. And she said, choose your country, use guidebooks to identify the areas most frequented by foreigners, and then go in the opposite direction. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, I recently went to Albania with my partner, who's in the back of the room, and we uh, spent a month wandering Albania. Uh, did not meet, a, well, we did meet one grouchy old American guy who wasn't coming back to New York until Obama wasn't president. <laughs> I was like, what? Okay. And um, I'm going to be going to Cuba for a month and not on a tour and uh, hitchhiking and just talking to people. That's the freedom of traveling when you have open space like that is you have time to sit down and talk to people. You're not trying to catch a train or a bus. You just can sit there and chat. Now, I'm going to read you a story that's in wildlife. <clears throat> Mutiny in the Galapagos. Hello? <laughs> what does that mean? You want to do some arm exercises? <laughs> I think he's telling me to hold up my book. Hold up the book. <laughs> Honey. <laughs> I'll do it for you. <laughs> oh, okay. This is her book. <laughs> Exotic Life, the first book, uh, but the woman actually contacted me, who is the model in that photograph, and she is a really pretty famous pole dancer from Los Angeles, <laughs> and one of David Chappelle's main models. Yeah, a really sweet girl named uh, Kath Kate Johnson. Yeah, a super sexy girl who can balance on a ladder. She's on a ladder at five o'clock in the morning at Man on Manhattan Beach in LA, the photographer placed her and photoshopped it on the unicycle. She does not know how to ride a unicycle, that she's pretty great on a pole. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Mutiny in the Galapagos, 1974. After a few hours of reconnoitering the dusty streets of Puerto Ayora, I found a fisherman who would take two off-duty scientific researchers and me on a tour of the Galapagos Islands if we paid for his beer and gas. We handed him a wad of crumpled banknotes, threw our rucksacks into his smelly rust, rust bucket of a boat, and headed out to sea. I was feeling quite proud of myself for activating a plan of exploration so expediently, having only just arrived on the island of Santa Cruz that morning. Chug, cough, sputter, chug, cough, sputter. The boat determinedly plowed through the watery troughs in spite of its congested rhythm, diesel fumes in our wake. Bound for islands unknown, I had a smile on my face until I noticed we were headed straight for a gargantuan rock. The captain was nowhere in sight. Alarmed, I tripped down the steps leading to the dark, dank hold to find him passed out on a mattress, his rumbling snores reverberating throughout the cabin. I shook him until his bloodshot eyes creaked open. He stared at me cross-eyed, then belched in my face. Judging by the plethora of empty cans strewn around him, he had stealthily managed to consume an entire case of beer in less than 30 minutes. <laughs> Luckily, one of the scientists knew how to take control of the boat. 
Disappointed, we turned the hulk around and headed back to port without hitting anything along the way. This was my first mutiny. Short of cash and bankrupt of a game plan, I abandoned the alcoholic captain and my fellow mutineers. At least no one had died. I couldn't say the same thing about the train trip I had taken two weeks earlier. I was riding on the roof, standard seating on overcrowded trains in South America, of the 1800s narrow gauge steam locomotive that connected Quito, the, mountains, the mountainous Andean capital of Ecuador, with the port town of Guayaquil via the dramatic avenue of the volcanoes. I always chose the roof to avoid the crowded, stinky conditions inside and get a spectacular view with thrills provided around every leaning turn. The train shunted back and forth along the steep, rocky promontory appropriately named Nariz del Diablo, the devil's nose, and suddenly it came to a grinding halt. An Otavalan Indian had tumbled off on one of the curves. There he lay on the tracks, at least part of him. His head had rolled into the weeds a few feet away. Feeling depressed and exhausted over my grim and graphic train odyssey, too many sweaty nights and sleazy bordellos waiting for transport, and the failed launch with a drunken fisherman into the wondrous world of rare endemic creatures, I craved chocolate. <laughs> the only store in tiny Puerto Ayora was a dimly lit shack stocked with cerveza, cigarillos, and manichos. Standing in line, the Manicho candy bar already unwrapped and melting in my mouth, I looked over the shoulder of the imposing shirtless man in front of me who was taking way too much time. He was writing a check. A check. There were no banks in the Galapagos. His robust curlicue signature spelled out Freddie Schmidt. I read about the legendary Schmidt's in a Sierra Club book lent to me by my scientific seatmates in the drafty military supply plane flying from Guayaquil to the Galapagos. Another detail of interest in the book was about one of the first European settlers on the Galapagos, a larger-than-life character named Reinhard Schmidt, who still lived there in a cave. The hulking man standing in front of me might be one of the founding fathers or their unshaven son. I reached up and tapped this Schmidt fellow on the shoulder. Can I buy you a Manicho? I said with feigned innocence. He turned slowly and responded in a booming, shack-shaking American voice, you bet. <laughs> we lounged on the splintered planks, slowly licking off the chocolate dripping from the wrappers. I asked, are you related to Reinhard Schmidt? Yeah, he's my dad. He asked, where are you from? San Franciscan, fourth generation. My relatives arrived during the gold rush. So you're a, a hippie, he asked with a smirk. I didn't answer, and after a while, Freddie asked, would you like to meet my wife? She's American and really misses her friends. We're on our honeymoon. We hopped into a small dinghy tied to the pier, and he rowed us out to a sailboat anchored in the bay. Draped on the bow was a tanned, bleached blonde babe in a <coughs> shell pink bikini. Freddie yelled up at her, catch the line, we have a visitor from California. She leaned forward, offering me her hand. I grabbed it, and she pulled me aboard past her ample bosom swinging like ripe cantaloupes. <laughs> My name is Sally Ann, she said in a southern drawl. Her teeth gleamed. She seemed thrilled to meet me. Freddie and I met in Florida. We just got married, and he wants to show me where he grew up. So he built this boat, and we sailed here through the Panama Canal, arriving just the other day. Freddie was pleased with our chatty connection and interjected. I want to show my little wife the secrets of the Galapagos and my favorite boyhood haunts. We're going to visit the pup and fur seals and my penguin buddies. Would you like to come along with us? That Manicho I bought Freddie was turning out to be the best 10 cent investment I ever made. <laughs> At 21, I was naive and more enthusiastic than smart. I failed to consider that it was a little weird for him to invite me on their honeymoon and that he hadn't consulted with his beloved. <laughs> I bit the hook of a serendipitous once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be steeped in the insider secrets of Darwin's Petri dish. Nodding like a bobblehead doll, I asked, what can I do in exchange for this generous offer? <laughs> how about you cook for us? Sally Ann doesn't know how. 
It turned out Sally Ann didn't know how to do too much except work on her tan, but there was something sweet and sincere about her that I liked. I love to cook. When do you want to leave? We'll buy supplies and leave tomorrow. We rode back to the pier, tied up the dinghy, and returned to the same tiny store where we met. He stocked up on flour sack bags stuffed with carrots, onions, and potatoes. I scripted gourmet menus in my head and asked, are we going to get any other food supplies? Freddie looked at me and said impatiently, no, this is all they have and we'll troll for tuna. It appeared that my assigned job was not going to be very demanding, so I fil filed the recipes for mushroom cream sauce, conch with a Tahitian lime marinade, and gazpacho back into my mental cookbook. The next afternoon, we soaked out of the harbor with a stiff wind at our back. Sally and I lay on the deck, watching the feathery clouds sweep past overhead. I asked, where are we headed? Freddie's ropey arms hoisted the sails. First stop, my penguin buddies on Isla Fernandina. Realizing the sun was setting and distracted by the mundane but demanding stomach growls, I asked, what about the tuna? I should get dinner ready. No problem. Freddie threw a thick 25-pound test fishing line with a wickedly barbed hook off the back of the boat. I thought a lead-weighted hook with bait was supposed to sink, but the bait skipped along the ocean <coughs> surface because we were racing across the water so quickly. As I pondered when I should heat up the skillet, the line pulled taut and a silvery tuna bounced along the wave tops, twisting and turning, mm -hmm. trying to unhook itself. Mm -hmm. Just as Freddie was showing me how to reel the three foot long fish into the boat, a massive shark burst out of the water and snagged the hook and fish whole, then jerked it under the sea in the blink of an eye. This became a daily occurrence. <laughs> and with it came a dilemma. It was easy catching the tuna. The challenge was really get in before the shark sharks nabbed it. And there were a lot of supersized sharks in the Galapagos due to the abundance of food sources in the nutrient-rich Humboldt Current. When we anchored in a bay to swim to shore, more fun than rowing and much more dangerous, to explore the wildlife there, one of us would be assigned to shark watch while the other swam swiftly to the beach. <laughs> the shark's fins could be seen circling far off, but the radius had to be several hundred feet before we felt safe enough to dive in and go for it. No time wasted dawdling or ogling, even if spotted eagle rays carpeted the sandy bottom. In one particularly crystalline bay, I was distracted by a school of translucent giant squid peering at me with luminous eyes. I circled above them, but then heard Freddie shout from the boat, Shark! Shark! Get your ass to the beach! <laughs> there was some karmic payback, karmic payback though, we wanted to use the sharks for bait, but how could we catch them since they were too big to reel in on the tuna line? I had the answer. Tampons. <laughs> <laughs> Two women whose menstrual cycles had sank just after a day of being in close quarters provided plenty of bait for catching tuna. <laughs> we speared a bloody cotton tube to an ominously large hook and Freddie lowered it into the water. Sharks are able to de detect as it was one part per million of blood in seawater, so it didn't take long to attract hefty hammerheads and greedy white tip reef sharks. It was thought that the shape of the hammerhead shark's head enhances olfaction as the nostrils are spaced far apart. That might explain why there were so many sharks churning the waters around the boat for a dinky tampon. <laughs> Leaning over the rail to watch the tampon sink downward in a watery pink halo, I stared in frozen horror into the giant teeth lined gaping mouth that lunged upward. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. The tampon dangled far down in the dark precipice of its gullet. Most of the time we would just tease the sharks and pull the tampon up before they got hooked, but when we needed meat for bait, Freddie would brazenly gaff the hammerhead with a huge steel barb and yank it over the rail in one mighty swoop. Sally Ann and I would jump back and hide behind the mast as the shark flailed on the deck. Freddy, in the stance of a gladiator about to slay his enemy, whacking the thrashing